in our series, we're looking at gifts that don't get as much um, attention. This one may be, in, uh, at first, at your first superficial thought, uh, that it wouldn't fit with those, because often the gift of teaching is something that gets a lot of attention, and that is a little bit more um, upfront and not spotlighted in the case of being special, just spotlighted in that, you know, it's more obvious. You know, when Paul describes the gifts, he says there are some gifts that are just out there and they're more presentable and obvious. There are other gifts that are more hidden and behind the scenes. And his whole point and my whole point would be, and yet all of them are of tremendous value in the kingdom of God. So that's why I did this series, was to kind of bring forward some of those things that we don't pay as much attention to. Some of these gifts are gifts that maybe people don't even associate as being gifts of the Spirit. There are others that Paul does not even bother to list in either of these passages, and he just covers with the biblical phrase of, and other spiritual gifts. And so they're just, they're just out there. And so I wanted to bring some attention to those. This one, as I said, maybe we would think that it gets a lot of attention. That's not why I want to look at it. I, I want to go to our, my, kind of my subtitle for this one, Forgotten Gifts and Forgotten Power. Teaching is a very powerful gift, and that, like anything powerful, is one of those things that can be used and it can be abused, right? So uh, it kind of goes both ways, but it's a very powerful gift. It's powerful often in ways that are the less obvious settings. We are teaching, you know, is being, again, the more obvious things. It might be preaching or teaching in uh, uh, King's Kids upstairs or in a Sunday school class or a Wednesday night class, an adult class, a ladies' uh, program, something like that. Those things are obvious. That's, that's kind of, we get that. But there is a lot of teaching that goes on in other realms and in other places. It can be one-on-one. It can be just uh, driving down the road with your grandkid and you share with them some wisdom from God's Word. They might not have even caught that that's what you were doing. They might have thought you were just talking about conversational things. Slipped it in there. There's mentoring and work. It is skipping, isn't it? So I'm going to go here. But I did tell them, at least this, t- this week, if it starts skipping... You have to do, you know, like a person guiding a 747 into the runway. You know, I don't, I don't see, hey, James, the microphone's not working. It doesn't happen. Because uh, so many of you have weird twitches and arm moves through church. I ignore those things. So I had to see bigger, bigger, bigger gestures. And they did it. Good job. All right. Uh, I don't know where it was that the mic cut out, so I'm just going to back up just a little bit. With teaching, you have all of those different settings. And all of them are just as powerful, whether it is riding in the car with your kid or wherever that may be. You may be somebody who has the talent of, of woodworking. And while you're doing that and teaching someone how to do woodworking, you're working at the lathe, you also start working in some spiritual lessons, not necessarily obvious or heavy-handed, over-the-top kind of stuff. You don't you know, break out a Pope hat and start talking to them or something like that. I was actually picturing more of an Orthodox person. They, you know, you don't have to do all of that setting. You simply share the truths of life and godliness with them as you go. And that is a gift. Uh, it might not fall quite as directly under the, the Greek word here for uh, teaching, which is didasko, which does lean more toward uh, formal teaching and, and preaching and, and evangelizing and things like that, but teaching in all its ways, when done through the Spirit, is a gift of the Spirit. And there are a lot more people who have the ability and the gift to do that within the kingdom than think so. Uh, it's also something, like a lot of these other gifts, that God gives you, in some ways, like a seed of a gift, and then expects you to let that grow. And so we sometimes make the mistake, especially in, especially in the gift of teaching, in thinking that because, you know, well, I tried that once and it was hard and I got nervous, I must not have that gift. And we are dead wrong sometimes. Anyone who has the gift of teaching is going to get nervous because anybody who has the gift of teaching and understands what they're about to get up and do understands the weight of responsibility of what they're about to do, and they would be a fool to take it lightly. So the fact that you feel nervous is not proof you don't have the gift at all. 
The reason I bring that up is because this is what I'm told by a lot of men, especially, that, well, I don't have that gift. Getting in front of people makes me nervous. Well, I'm sorry, but that you didn't explain anything to me. Because even if you have it, that will happen unless you're nuts, you know? If you get up and you're not nervous ever, that's not a gift, that's arrogance. So don't let that hold you back. That may not be at all a sign you don't have the ability to teach. It may just be that, okay, you take seriously what it is, and so you want to make sure that you can. Let me, let me swat another, I'm going to swat a few excuses before we move on to slides. Can I do that? Here's another excuse we get, and it's actually in a slide later, but I'm jumping. Fear is one with nervousness and fear of not knowing enough. You find me a teacher who thinks they know enough, and once again, I'll tell you, you found a fool. No teacher, preacher, instructor, professor of God's Word believes that he knows everything he needs to know, or he's a fool, and he does not need to be a teacher. Okay? You, first of all, never cease being a student. If you think you already know, I know a lot of church members. The ones I'm thinking of aren't here. I don't mean like not here this today. Don't be looking around. Not here, not in this congregation, but I've known them who believe they know. I already know everything I need to know. They don't, they don't, they don't want anybody teaching them anything new because I already know what I need to know. And you know what you know about a brother who tells you that? He ain't no squat diddly. And he isn't humble, and he needs to repent. A real teacher has to come to the Word first as a student who knows they don't know anything. So if you feel like, I don't know enough to be a teacher, let me set you up with a class, because you know the number one thing. <laughs> okay, you already got the first part. You know that you don't know enough. If you know where to go find it, you know the second, equally most important thing. You go to the Word. The gift of teaching will not give you the confidence to teach without study. The gift of teaching will give you the confidence in God to direct your path in your study and to help you through as you get nervous and you take on the weight of teaching. Okay, The gift is not a, a, any kind of a, a perfect ability. Many people have been incredibly eloquent and terrible teachers because what they taught wasn't right or it wasn't for the right reasons or it wasn't demonstrated actually in their life later on. And part of the gift of teaching is going to be that you actually live what you teach. That's part of the weight of teaching. Now let's look at a few passages that talk about it. And these are very general uh, because... Uh, the people who received these letters knew what they were talking about, so he didn't describe too much. But this is, again, just kind of the idea that this is definitely a gift. I'm going to read it off of my outline because I've turned to the wrong one again. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, And God placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, there that one is again, of guidance and of different kinds of tongues. So in that list is this teaching. And again, it's a Greek word called didasko. It is kind of this more formal teaching thing we're doing here today. But that is a gift of the Spirit that is necessary in the church. Now, when he talks about these, he's saying these are all the different parts of the body and all these different things need to function. They have a purpose and God intends them to be there. That being said, we live in a time where there is, you might not think so, but there is a great shortage of these people. Go ask a recruiter to any, any of our ministry training programs in the church. Those no enrollment numbers have been going down, and those aren't people necessarily that had the gift, okay? You don't have to go into preaching school. You don't have to go into a Christian college or a seminary to have the gift of teaching. And some people go through those and have an entire career, but they weren't gifted. So that's not you know just necessarily a tell, okay? But I think the desire to do that, the willingness to do that, being decreasing in significant ways is telling. Okay, and this is not just like in Churches of Christ. This is across Christendom. Churches of all kinds, there is a drought 
Now, here's my question before I go on to a couple of these scriptures and some of these, some more of these excuses. There's a drought of people willing to exercise the gift. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's a drought of the Spirit's ability to, I'm going to make up a word, to in-gift those people? The Spirit hasn't gone anywhere. His ability to gift hasn't gone anywhere. His desire to see people teach, preach, evangelize, train up small children in the gospel, none of those things have gone away. But volunteers to step up and say, Lord, would you give me that gift so I can go? That is decreasing. And that, kingdom-wide, we should be very concerned about. We should be praying about. And it should be, here's another song we could add to the list, not here am I, send them. That's not what Isaiah said. Here am I, send me. That we need more people who will be lit on fire to ask the Lord, Lord, would you please help me do this? We need that desperately within the church, and we need to stop assuming that the, God, that the Lord will send somebody else or somebody else's children and grandchildren. We ought to be raising up the next generations with that as a, uh, a goal that each of us would have people in our families who go out and do that and are able to do that. This should be something we're praying about. Romans chapter 12. Did I leave that? I think I did. All right. Once I get my equipment spread out up here, then, you know, it becomes a problem. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 7. And uh, this may read just a slightly differently from the screen. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. I want to stop there for a second because this applies to all the gifts, this one too. We look at something sometimes as, well, I don't know if I had that ability or I had that gift or I had that desire or whatever, but if you actually know that God has given you that ability, but you just don't like to do it, remember these words. We all belong to all the others. You belong to all the others. You may be given a gift, not that gives you thrills and chills, but you've been given a gift that builds other people up. And that may be its purpose. I don't get the impression that Jeremiah liked having the gift of prophecy and teaching. It brought him a lot of tears. It brought him a lot of hardship. It brought him some special struggles. But Jeremiah, when he got to the point where he said, this may be my gift, but can I, can I, can I forward this on? Can we re-gift the gift of the Spirit, Lord? He said, however, when I try to keep quiet, what happens? It is like a fire shut up in my bones. Peter put it this way, how can we not teach? Once you've been gifted, once you've been given the opportunity to do something, it ought to light you up, even if it's a responsibility, not necessarily your greatest joy. Okay? So, bonus excuse that you can throw away there. Thank you, Paul. If it, He goes on, verse 6, If we have different gifts according to the grace given us, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. And if it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously, and so on and so on. The newer NIV words it slightly differently. Let's see here. I've got to find it. It says, if it is teaching, then teach. And I think, I think that's what they meant. I think that's how it says that. It doesn't say let him. I think both those things are true. I like both of those wordings. If it's let him, then it's like telling the rest of us, listen, this person has been gifted by God to do this, whatever gift it is, to do this work or let her do this work. Let them do it. Get out of the way. But the newer NIV, they kind of took a little bit different approach and, and said it, then teach, as if to say to the person, stop using the other people as excuses. 
Get out there and do what God has called you to do. Do what God has gifted you to do. Do what God has put you in a position for you to do. Because that's why he did it. To question his wisdom is to consider yourself wiser than God. That, that's not wise, okay? That's just the way that works. Ephesians chapter 4, again, just to give us kind of the, the importance of all of these. I'm going to read this one that has the same wording. So Christ himself gave the apostles. Who gave them? Christ. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. He tells us the purpose of this gift. The purpose of this gift. We won't go into all the others there. But the purpose of teaching, and again, it's the same word that he uses in Romans and 1 Corinthians, so he's know he's talking to the same people and same giftedness. He's given that so that the church becomes a better church, that the people become better people, and not just better people, but better in their service and their fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. So that you, as a brother or sister, can mature and grow into the fullness of Christ. It isn't just to make a person uh, get up and, and give a little bumper sticker lesson that makes a person feel better. It is so that they actually live up to the character of Christ. When we say things like, well, you're just not going to get people to be able to live up to the example of Christ. We repeat Satan's lie, not the truth of Scripture. Christ has given us what we need to live up to the example of Christ. It's whether or not we had the faith, whether or not we are hearing the Word, and whether or not we're yielding to the Spirit to see that happen. But the Spirit is giving us what we need. Christ has given us teachers we need, shepherds we need, so that we can get there. What we need to do is trust the process. You know, you go into, uh, you're in junior high, you're a seventh grader, so you know everything, right? You go into athletics at seventh grade, and the coach starts telling you what you need to do, and what happens? You start saying things like, well, he doesn't know what he's doing. I already know how to do that. And you say, you ever heard that, Curly? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's an amen and a yes. Yes. And, and kids go in there and they just, they already know how to do it all. Well, again, sometimes people come to church with the same attitude. Same attitude. And what do you need to do? Yield to the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Word. And God has given us people, just like He's given coaches. Well, some coaches didn't come from Him. I think we know that. Uh, <laughs> some coaches come from Jerry Jones, and that's a totally different kingdom. Uh, but he's, he's given teams coaches. There are good coaches out there who do teach and use a gift that I think is from the Spirit. Those do exist. Uh, but but as, as Mark was saying the other day, we don't get to see those nearly as often as we should. But, but they do exist. Same thing in the church. What if you're one of those? What if you're one of those and you don't know it yet? Whether that's as a Sunday school teacher, a King's Kids teacher, a kitchen table Bible study teacher, a class teacher, a future preacher, a missionary, an elder, a deacon. What if that's you? And you just haven't paid attention to what God's been trying to fan into flame within you. Paul had to remind Timothy himself, a good brother... Timothy, you need to fan into flame the gift that was given to you. Why? Because Timothy, a missionary, had to be reminded God does equip, God does gift, and God does expect fruitfulness and faithfulness to those gifts. And Timothy was somebody like a lot of you that would say, I don't, I don't think that's my gift. And Paul just kept saying, I think it is. I think it is. I think you need to get out there and get it done. And on top of that, Paul made sure that some elders at a church had laid their hands on Timothy and prayed over him 
so that Timothy couldn't even say, well, I don't think anybody else thinks so, Paul. Because Paul just says, really? How come those elders put their hands on you and prayed over you and told you you had that gift that you need to fan into flame? So Paul reminds him, and Timothy steps up, and he does it. And that's what we need to do. Too often, we're like Matthew 25. We take our coin, we put it in a napkin, we fold it up, we bury it in the dirt, and we say, I'm not sure that's my gift. That's troublesome because Jesus said, you know, eventually the Lord's going to come back and he's going to expect something from that gift. And what are you going to do? Hand him a dirty napkin with a coin in it? He says, the master in the parable, dude, you're out. And Jesus is saying, and I think the same way. So don't bury your gift. Don't deny every opportunity to find out what it is. Don't let fear drive you back. So what are some of these th reasons that it gets lost? Here they are. First is a lack, again, of confidence and fear. And I think I've told you enough about that one. Second is poor comparisons. We look at other people, and we look at maybe some heroes who were good teachers. And again, in whatever setting, it might have been while you were working at a lathe, and somebody who mentored you might have been a coach. And we look at them and we say, well, but they were more than I am. And that's, that might even be true. That might be, you might be giving yourself a totally fair assessment. You don't have what they have. Except, they didn't either when they start. You're comparing a sapling or a seed to a mighty oak. And that's not a fair comparison, is it? Be content to say, Lord, I'm just a sapling. Not a sap, but a sapling. I'm just a sapling, Lord, but I believe you can make me more. I think you can make this ministry more. I think you can help me through this. And trust him. God makes those mighty oaks only from a tiny seed. Then none of them come full grown. It doesn't happen. So don't worry that you're not there yet. Don't worry about what you don't know. Pray trust the Lord, get into the Word, study, ask. Ask the person that you're looking up to for help. If they really got the gift you think they do of teaching, they'll help you and they'll be excited about it. You might re reinvigorate their own flame because they see something in you. Trust them. Get after it and just let God do His thing. The third one here is that we. this is so weird for the Church of Christ to have done because we don't even believe in this. We don't even use these words. But we still have done it. We've bought into a false divide between clergy and laity. And we don't even believe that divide is supposed to be there. We believe in the ministry and the sainthood and the work of all saints, every Christian, every person who believes and is baptized into Christ. We believe that. If we believe that, why do we say silly things like, well, I think some things are better left to the professionals? Anybody who has the gift of the Spirit that comes from the Holy Spirit doesn't believe that they are a professional in the first place. Now, they may, in senses of ethics and excellent work and good habits, want to be professional. But any good teacher in the kingdom of God does not see his work as a career or as a profession. It's a ministry, which is another word for service, which is another kind of just being a bond slave of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul never said, look at me, I'm a professional apostle. He said, I'm a bond slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. That's the attitude that we've got to keep. So don't even worry about that. There's no leaving it to the professionals. The book of Amos, one of the most powerful books of the prophets in Scripture, the guy was a fig tree farmer. I wish I could have had one because my grandmother's fig tree is gone. He was a, a, a tenderer of trees, okay? What George W. Bush liked to call, call an arbotriest. I love that word. You know, I think that's an arbotriest. I love that. That's what he was. It doesn't matter what you do as a profession. It matters what you do in faithfulness to God. That's what determines it. Some of the best teachers in the world, the Pharisees looked at and said, you know, we didn't train you. Where'd you get that? It's what they said at the temple when they're interrogating 
Peter, where'd you guys get this? We can see that you don't have our training. No, they didn't. A few fishermen changed the world. The gift of teaching, and I like how this guy put it, uh, the gift of teaching is the ability to put truth on the bottom shelf for everyone to grasp and understand. That's what it ought to be. It should never be about, let me now impress you with my big vocabulary. It should never be about degrees on the wall, although those are fine. It should be about, did I say that where everybody could understand it? If not, did I answer your question when you asked in follow-up? And you should never be unquestionable. An unquestionable teacher should not be a teacher. Okay? Ever, ever, ever. That was another bonus, should not. Wasn't in there. Second, teaching is primarily about, excuse me, not. Teaching is not primarily about the exchange of information, but about character building and spiritual growth. That's what he said in Ephesians 4, isn't it? It's about building you up. It's about equipping you so that you can serve and you can build up the kingdom and so that you grow up into the fullness of the character of Christ. It's not about the teacher. It's not about how much can I cram into your head today. It's about moving the needle closer and closer to Jesus in our character, in our spiritual growth. It's spiritual formation. That's what teaching ought to be. And again, that happens in so many places. Uh, Y'all are working with uh, Bridge to Hope. That's spiritual formation. That's another place where the gift of teaching comes out. The ability to tie things that you're doing with your hands, that you're learning about life, but tying that together and building spiritual bridges and helping people to grow in their faith. Jesus exhibited all these things, didn't he? Every single kind of setting that there could be, Jesus used to tell people about God and the kingdom of God. And every kind of way, whether it was from a boat or whether it was at a dinner table, whether it was to adults, whether it was to children, even when he was a child and teaching adults as a 12-year-old. And sometimes you can see it in a kid already young Christian that's 12 years old and they already start to exhibit some incredible maturity. It's a gift of the Spirit sometimes. Jesus used all those things. And when he did, it changed hearts and lives. And you can do the same. Absolutely, you can do the same. On the road to Emmaus, he's talking to those two guys. They're sitting there, they're eating. And right after he breaks the bread, and it's so weird, this is a side thing, but when he prays and he breaks the bread, the wording in the book of Luke is as if they're sitting there at a communion table. Go back and look at it on your own time. It's really incredible. And it's interesting how many times that happens in Scripture in places we don't expect. And then he disappears. And they look at each other. They say, Did, didn't our hearts just, didn't they just burn while he was telling us all of this? Well, what he had done, he'd used the gift of teaching. He had shown them from Moses and the prophets everything that was supposed to happen and what had just happened and opened the scriptures up to them and he taught them. And they said, didn't, didn't our hearts just burn? And what'd they do? They ran back and they told everybody about it. Now, what do you do when you see Jesus? What do you do when you hear what God wants to do within you and what God has done already in your life and in your heart and in your spirit? What are you going to do with it when you see Jesus? When you hear the gospel taught or when you're one of those people who takes up this mantle and you're telling somebody the story of Jesus and as you're teaching it, you also hear it again yourself, what are you going to do? You're going to go and you're going to tell. You're going to go and spread the word. And in your going and in your telling, who's behind that? The Spirit of God. And every time you take him up on the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody, you get to exercise that gift to the glory of God. Isn't that cool? So my question comes back around again. What if that's you? What if that's you? What if it's this week? What if it's today? And what are you going to do with it?